Hello and welcome to today's National Press Club Westpac Address coming to you from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. My name is Anna Henderson. I'm the Chief Political Correspondent for SBS World News and a board member here at the club. Today we welcome US-based national security experts Richard Fontaine and Beth Sanna. They're here for the first ANU International National Security College Conference, which has been happening over the past few days. And we've had some of the most senior members of the government in attendance and, of course, world-renowned experts also taking part. Richard is the Chief Executive Officer of the Centre for a New American Security. Before that, he was a foreign policy advisor to Senator John McCain and worked for the State Department. Uh, he also included in his backstory foreign policy advice to the McCain 2008 presidential campaign. Beth Sanna is a senior fellow at Harvard University's Belfer Center and former deputy director of national intelligence. She served as the deputy director of the national intelligence for mission integration and held several senior leadership positions in the CIA's directorate of analysis, including leading the analytic effort on South Asia and serving as the deputy for analysis for Russian and European affairs. The topic for today's address is beyond Taiwan, are there other crocodiles closer to the boat? The United States in the Indo-Pacific pivoting or pretending. So we'd be very interested to hear uh, the thoughts from both of these important uh, contributors to this conversation. And you can follow along as well at Press Club Ost or hashtag NPC. Let's first welcome Beth Sanna. Thanks so much, Anna, and thank you so much to the National Press Club for having us here today, um, and to Rory Medcalf and the whole team at ANU's National Security College for bringing me to Australia. Um, it's been a long time since I've been here, and it's just been an absolute pleasure. And so important for me, I think, especially to hear uh, the Australian perspective. I think of you as our closest allies, so, uh, what you think uh, means a lot to me. So I was going to kick off today um, with my presentation about are there crocodiles closer to the boat than Taiwan? Um, do people get that? We say in America alligators closer to the boat, but I turned it into crocodiles because I thought it was funny and I laughed uh, when I did it. But no one here is laughing, so I guess it's just it's just me. But I think it's funny. Um, so the most I, I speak a lot about geopolitics, and um, as I'm talking, uh, people ask me, the most common question people ask me is, when is China going to invade Taiwan? And I think that's an important question. So I don't want anybody to get me wrong here that I'm saying that we shouldn't be worried about that. But I think that the Middle East crisis has taught us, um, and we keep learning this lesson over and over again, that sometimes we prepare for conflict or for disruption, but something else happens that we're not expecting. People asked me last year, two years ago, um, about the Middle East, and I called it an underappreciated threat when a lot of people were saying it was an underappreciated success. But no one asked me about Hamas. They asked me about Iran. And no one asked me about whether the Houthis had the capability or the intent to um, disrupt shipping in the Red Sea. And so I want people to be thinking about the Pacific, not just about this idea way out in the future that may not happen, hopefully. Uh, hopefully, AUKUS and our other efforts to deter China means that maybe we won't have a conflict with China. I'm hoping that that's the case. But there are other kinds of disruptions that could happen, and they could actually happen sooner. So I have a three on my list, and um, they are North Korea going sideways, and I'll get into that in just a second. The Philippines clash with China, uh, which could escalate, including drawing in the United States and maybe others. And my third category is whiskey tango foxtrot, um, which is, you know, I don't know what's going to happen here, but there's stuff that could go wrong. I think that's for this audience we can use that phrase. Um, so I, I don't think in this, with this audience I need to talk about why North Asia and disruption in North Asia is important to you, do I? I mean, China and Japan are your number one trade partners. You get a lot of refined petroleum and other products from South Korea, right? It's kind of important, so let's just get right into it. 
I've been saying that North Korea is a threat, an underappreciated threat for some time now. And um, at some point, I might be right. It's not actually a contest because there's a lot at stake here, so I, I would love to be wrong here. But I'm worried that 2024 is actually the period where um, risks are so high that maybe I will be right. Um, three reasons. One, three signs, maybe, signposts for us that things are different this year. Um, the first is Kim has really had this change in rhetoric. And probably people heard Penny Wong's speech um, at the press club or at uh, wherever we were for NSC, the Arboretum a couple days ago, where she talked about how um, Kim has now gotten this, this boost from um, no longer having UN monitoring uh, against the sanctions. But what we're really seeing in Kim is that he is no longer saying that South Korea, North Korea reconciliation, reunification is a goal. That was a goal that was put into the Constitution by his grandfather. That's now out. And literally, I was looking at an article about how they were having school children because they don't have time to reprint textbooks. The part of the school children's day is crossing that out with pencil now reunification. They're serious about it. And he's ordered the country's army, munitions, industry, nuclear weapons, and civil defense sectors to accelerate war preparations in response to confrontational moves by the US. There's also been this change of confidence, and that is because of the relationship with Russia. They've put the satellite into space now with, we think, with Russian help. Um, we have this uh, Russians and Chinese really backing North Korea and the Security Council. And today, we have the most senior visit visitor from China to Pyongyang since um, President Xi was there about five years ago in 2019. And the message that President Xi bought, brought to Kim at that moment in June of 2019 was, you know, the world wants you to negotiate on your nuclear program with the United States. Think about how different a world we are in right now. That is not exactly at the top of the agenda. Um, trying to tear down the United States and the world order is. And then the third thing is the capabilities, right? That Kim tested five ICBMs last year. We know that he has the capability of hitting the United States with an ICBM anywhere in the continental United States. We don't know if the nuclear warhead would explode as expected, but as I say, that would be a bad day for anyone, no matter how that goes. Um, he can hit any place in Japan, including US forces in Guam, with a nuclear weapon. And he also has a lot of short-range ballistic missiles, as well as artillery, that can reach as far as Seoul. So, there's a lot going on here that's different, and it feels different. And scholars disagree about why, but they agree on one thing. Regardless of the cause, a surge in North Korea's belligerence is highly likely in 2024. And that could include high-intensity provocations like a seventh nuclear test, which we've been waiting for for some time, uh, a missile test near Guam or Hawaii, a limited attack on South Korean territory. They've done that before, not out of the question, or a combination of these events. And the pathway to a conflict on the Korean Peninsula between um, North and South Korea obviously would involve the United States since we have about 28,000 troops there and we're positioned right there. So with this increasing belligerence, increasing confidence, and increasing capabilities, this gives Kim a lot of options. And a history of clashes has, has been around. He's had this history of clashes. And so pursuing these provocations is absolutely not unthinkable. Excuse the double negative. Add in geo geographic proximity, which is different than China and Taiwan, and the offensive rather than defensive military doctrines on both sides that make escalation much, much more likely, because it's actually written into the plan. So these factors definitely could cause escalation and make it very difficult to back off. OK, the second thing, second Thomas Scholl. This will go faster now. 
A week ago, President Marcos announced plans to implement new countermeasures against what he called illegal, coercive, aggressive, and dangerous attacks by China's Coast Guard against resupply missions to the deteriorating, rusting hull of a ship, which came from the United States, which has been intentionally grounded on Second Thomas Shoal since the late 1990s. This is a US vessel called the Sierra Madre. Most of you have heard of this before because it is in the press now more than ever. Um, China is insisting that the Philippines remove the ship. The Philippines is saying no. And now Marcos is saying, we're going to take countermeasures. Uh, he doesn't say what those will be, but that they will be proportionate, deliberate, and reasonable. However, two Philippine security officials have told the press that they've recommended that Manila use faster military vessels instead of chartered civilian ships to do these resupply missions. Now, the rub here is that the US Mutual Defense Treaty includes that attacks on the Philippines would trigger the treaty, but also attacks on Philippine vessels. And we're waiting for the readout of the Biden Marcos Kishida trilateral meeting, but some press reports say that President Biden will use the appearances at the summit to warn China that the Mutual Defense Treaty also would in include a Chinese attack on the Sierra Madre. So that doesn't feel great, even though it's really important for us to defend the Philippines and their rights, because the International Tribunal said they have every right to be there. Complicated. And then the third thing is my whisko, whiskey tango foxtrot. I'm trying to say that right and not in a bad way. Um, <laughs> There have been a lot, there's a lot of military activity. There are a lot of exercises. These are good things in many ways, but there's a lot of proximity of military equipment in the region. And while there has been a decrease in the number of dangerous Chinese um, proximate crossing, getting close to US and allied aircraft and vessels. Um, it's gone down since Biden met with Xi. There's still this, this, this risk. Um, and I also think that this risk around Taiwan, so we think about an invasion, but we should also think about an inadvertent clash around Taiwan and what would happen then. And so I put that on my WTF list. And, um, and I think it's, it's kind of obvious what's going on. We've had 4,800 sorties of Chinese aircraft into and around Taiwan's airspace in the past four years from basically almost nothing, right? And this really has become the new normal. And the Chinese are increasingly conducting complex air and naval military exercises and placing parts of the waterways off limits at different times. So this new normal around Taiwan raises the risk of an accidental confrontation. And that is a, also a problem because there's no official contact between Beijing and Taipei. So what do you do if something happens? How do you have a communication to make it stop? And there is a worry that China, because of the position that they've put themselves in about, about defending their national territory, that if there is such a clash, that they would feel a, the, a need to follow through and to keep going. So we could kind of back into a Taiwan scenario in this way. And part of the problem is that the Taiwanese are not dealing with this issue in a transparent manner or a consistent manner. So their public really doesn't understand what's going on. They don't understand the threat. And the Chinese don't really understand Taiwanese red lines. And that's usually a bad way of conducting deterrence. So I'm going to stop there with my scary world. Um, and during Q&A, I'm sure we'll say something more positive. And I'll turn it over to Richard. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Beth, and uh, for scaring us all. And uh, 
<laughs> that, exactly. Um, and thank you to the National Press Club for having us. It's uh, wonderful to be here and it's wonderful to be back in Canberra. And again, uh, congratulations to the National Security College and Rory and to everyone, um, Carolyn and everyone who put on such a wonderful conference and brought us uh, here to Australia. Um, I've said before that I think the sweetest words in the English language are, can you come to Australia for blah, dot, dot, dot. And it <laughs> almost doesn't matter what the dot, dot, dot actually is. So the answer is usually yes, um, but it's great to be back here. So what I'm gonna uh, discuss is US policy in the Indo-Pacific and try to answer the question that is the title of this little talk, which is, is the United States finally pivoting to Asia or is it just pretending to do so while we talk about it? Um, and if you look at U.S. foreign policy today uh, and people who think about this in the political class, among policymakers, despite the fact that there are these raging wars in Europe and the Middle East, if you just sort of stop someone and said, what is the region most important to the United States right now and in the future, you would get a pretty broad consensus that the Indo-Pacific is the right answer, even with Russia, Ukraine, even with Israel, Gaza, and these other kinds of things. And you know, some of the reasons for this are longstanding and obvious. The economic weight of this region, the, the demographic uh, uh, you know, size and, and promise, and of course the China-driven geopolitical rivalry uh, that exists here. And so the notion has been for quite a while in US foreign policy, and I think is ve there uh, very much present today, that the Indo-Pacific should receive a disproportionate amount of time and energy and attention and resources relative to other regions that the United States will still remain active in. This isn't a new idea. It was in 2011 when President Barack Obama came to Canberra and spoke to the Australian uh, Parliament. And uh, he said, and this is a quote from him, in, the, in Asia Pacific in the 21st century, the United States of America is all in. He said that Washington would wind down the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and pivot its focus eastward. And on offer were stepped up military presence and resources, more diplomacy, the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal. Uh, and by pivoting to Asia, the United States was gonna reap the dividends on offer uh, given the great economic dynamism of this region. And it was also going to stabilize relations with China and deepen its partnerships and alliances in this area. Um, well, uh, a lot has happened since 2011. And uh, if you look back at the trajectory of US foreign policy there, you don't see certainly as much pivot to Asia as the architects of that policy had wanted, which is a bit peculiar because there was widespread support for that idea in 2011. I think quite arguably the Trump administration came from uh, a similar sort of uh, view about what was most important as the Obama administration and then the Biden administration uh, as well. And so uh, the question is having, if you look back at um, the distribution of military resources, the level of, uh, of diplomatic activity, certainly if you look at our absence of trade policy, uh, it's pretty hard for the first decade or so after the announcement of this pivot to actually see a meaningful one here. There were a lot of things happening in other parts of the world. The wars didn't line, wind down and so forth. And uh, I, I should say I, I have looked at this pretty intently because um, with uh, Ambassador Robert Blackwell and I have a book which will be available in fine bookstores everywhere. Um, <laughs> Actually, I don't know if it will, but it's definitely on Amazon. Um, <laughs> that's coming out in June called Lost Decade, the, Piv the US Pivot to Asia and the Rise of Chinese Power. And we look at this broader phenomenon. Um, so what I uh, would say is that, you know, we've learned some lessons along the way, and we've learned some lessons about what it means to try to prioritize this part of the world and what it doesn't. Um, as I said, at first, we haven't, um, really until recently acted commensurate with our rhetorical and our strategic kind of commitment. Uh, if you look at the US military resources in the Indo-Pacific from 2011 through 2021 or so, um, they're basically the same as where they began. At the same time, of course, China's has grown by leaps and bounds. The diplomacy has been up sometimes, depending on what else is going on in the world and who's in the White House and who's in the State Department and then down sometimes if there are other priorities like the Middle East peace process or Syria or Iran or things like that. And then sort of up again and things like that. Trade policy, as everyone here knows, sort of went kaput with the uh, withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and, uh, and it hasn't come back. That said, I think things are actually changing now and have been changing uh, for the past couple of years. 
Um, and that change flows from this bipartisan consensus that I mentioned uh, at the beginning, which is the United States is engaged in a long-term competition with China, and that that competition is going to play out in lots of places, but more so in the Indo-Pacific than in any other region of the world. So the Biden administration, like its predecessor, but unlike the Bush and Obama administrations, has identified China as the foremost foreign policy challenge and Asia as the priority theater. And it's been trying to stick to that even while we do things like provide vast quantities of assistance to Ukraine and get involved diplomatically and otherwise in uh, Israel and Gaza and the Middle East and things like that. Um, and so if you step back and look over the past couple of years, what I would say is starting to amount to sort of a latter day pivot to Asia, you can see a number of good examples. AUKUS is one of those, I would suggest. Done right, that agreement is going to provide more military capability among allies working more closely together to enhance deterrence, including in Japan and key elements of that uh, is, a, is a great step and can strengthen the approach. Adding other countries like Canada and New Zealand would also uh, do similar things. The administration has reinvigorated the Quad before the Biden administration came in. There had never been a Quad um, leaders meeting, and while it had been sort of revived under the Trump administration, people said, well, it's kind of a meeting in search of an agenda. People don't say that anymore. And it's become kind of a regular feature and a platform to do things that otherwise uh, would be much harder. The United States has announced new embassies in places like the Solomon Islands, and Kiribati, and Tonga, and Maldives, and is upgrading its defense alliance with the Philippines. Um, Beth talked about the presence of President Marcos in Washington right now, but there's also the presence of Prime Minister Kishida of Japan, where just a couple of hours ago they announced some upgrading of the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance to try to get the uh, actual way of operating together in a contingency to be much closer and forethought uh, than it has been before. The United States has concluded agreements related to the compacts of free association um, and, uh, and even with Indonesia. Uh, last year, the United States upgraded a relationship with Indonesia to a comprehensive uh, strategic partnership. I would say also pretty critically despite the major draw on military resources in other regions of the world, the Defense Department has more or less preserved its force structure out in this part of the world and tried to do that uh, quite deliberately. All of these efforts are ultimately designed to deal more effectively with a rising China, of course also to take advantage of the promise out here, but primarily to, to deal more effectively uh, with rising China. They're taking place while there are other demands on U.S. engagement in the Europe and the Middle East, and there always will be demands uh, for U.S. engagement in other parts of the world. But it does suggest to me that at long last, the United States is starting a pivot to Asia. I think this time it is for real. It is, however, incomplete. Uh, the pace of diplomacy is high. The United States mil military uh, investments and posture, defense modernization, um, alliance sort of upgrades and things like that. The gaping hole uh, is any semblance of a trade policy uh, in this part of the world or, frankly, any other part of the world. The hopes of TPP were dashed years ago, and even last year, the quite modest Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Agreement uh, foundered on the shoals of our domestic politics. I think it's pretty clear that no coherent approach to Asia is complete without a significant economic pillar to it, and uh, we don't have that one right now. I'm hoping that a Biden to or even a Trump to, uh, neither of whom would need to be or could be reelected and would be less um, subject to domestic politics, could move something on the trade front, including maybe in the areas of digital trade. Um, but as the United States focuses more on this part of the world, it also faces a broader strategic issue, which is that we're going to remain a global power with commitments all over the world. And so, of course, the United States seeks outcomes all over the place, from preventing terrorist attacks to supporting Israel to assisting uh, Ukraine to securing its, its southern border. And you can see this in the real resource allocation, too. I mean, within 
weeks of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, 20,000 additional American troops were deployed to Europe. Now that number is 30,000, uh, more than were there before. The war has depleted a lot of Western stocks of ammunition and, uh, and, and weapons, and the United States has delayed weapons transfers to Taiwan because of the demand that this has put here after Hamas's attack on Israel, the United States. Uh, the previous year had been the first year in something like two decades where there hadn't been a U.S. aircraft carrier strike group on regular deployment in the Middle East. Well, after that attack, there were two. There were two out there off the coast of Israel. Now there's one. Um, and of course, our Secretary of State has spent vast quantities of time on Middle East shuttle diplomacy and things like that. So there's these sort of opportunity costs and so forth. So the question before, I think, uh, the United States right now and an administration, the Biden administration, or frankly, I think if there's a, a, another Trump administration, there's a general consensus to put Asia first, but to do so while we have to deal with all these other issues, the question is, how do you do this? Um, a few principles here that I think uh, is starting to be absorbed. One is just a simple do more in Asia mantra is insufficiently subtle that, you know, you have to take into account, you know, military resources, uh, uh, you know, given to help the French in Africa is not necessarily bad just because it's not in Asia, right? You have to think about the value of these things. Um, important to see how U.S. engagement in Asia flows ultimately from the kind of world we want to seek, the positive vision of this international order that we talk about, but can be boiled down in much more sort of um, concrete uh, terms. And then uh, remaining actually quite engaged in other regions, because if you have a major crisis in Europe or the Middle East, the United States will in almost inevitably respond to it. And so it is far better to remain engaged and try to dampen the possibility that those things uh, might happen in the first place. Um, than to have to react to them post hoc and then draw the attention, the resources, the time uh, and the energy away from what we would otherwise uh, be doing in Asia. That is much easier said than done. I think there's some ways uh, to do that. We've learned some lessons along the way about, for example, the cost of withdrawing all of our troops from Iraq. I'm afraid we might learn the same lesson in Afghanistan um, and sort of the importance of engagement. Um, but if you step back from the whole thing, uh, Pivot to Asia announced in 2011, here we are in 2024, and I think there's real signs that it's actually happening. So, thanks. Well, you've given us a lot to think about and uh, to be fearful of as well, Beth, <laughs> while Richard's uh, getting comfortable. And thank you both so much for sort of giving us that direct um, deep dive into your thinking at this point. I did want to bring you back to something that's actually in the headlines here today and get your thoughts uh, on the news that the US president has been asked this morning by a journalist while he was walking through the White House grounds whether he's considering uh, the, the efforts by the Australian parliament to push for the prosecution against Julian Assange to be dropped. And he said three words, we're considering it. Uh, and they've made pretty major headlines throughout the day here. And I'm curious to know from both of your points of view, uh, whether or not uh, the view in the US is, in fact, uh, at the sort of leadership level that this has gone on uh, for too long, or, and how likely it is that those requests from Australia could be answered with the answer they want. Those are those are the answers. So, um, you know, I think that there are obviously issues here about um, right and wrong about secrecy, about um, the way that secrets are provided to the public, responsibly, irresponsibly. <laughs> I think I know which one in my mind Julian Assange falls under. Um, but I think that, you know, to me, uh, at this point in time, it's a bit of um, a distraction and a, uh, it is an irritant that we don't need. So I would like the uh, justice departments of the various countries to figure out a way of doing the right thing, um, but um, allowing maybe the Australians to take the lead on figuring out how to do that. Mm. Yeah, I don't have a super well-developed view on this other than, so I don't know specifically what the right answer would be other than I think what Julian Assange did is a travesty. 
uh, on multiple levels. And I think the most important thing is to assure that wherever he is, he is not able to conduct those kinds of uh, activities again, nor inspire others to do similarly. So what it requires in order to make that happen, um, I think, you know, could be worked out. But I think that's the bottom line. Do you think there is an appetite, though, uh, notwithstanding your position, uh, within the US uh, justice system and also from the president to see that this has gone on as the Australian government contends and the opposition here as well for long enough? I don't know. I mean, three words were pretty non-committal. Um, so <laughs> yeah. uh, just on the face of it, it sounds a little bit like what a politician says when they get a drive-by uh, question that they're not fully prepared to answer in some sort of developed way. Um, but I don't know what else you can read into it. Yeah, it was very off the cuff, certainly. <laughs> uh, Andrew Green. Uh, good afternoon, Beth and Richard. Andrew Green from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. While we're talking about the phonetic alphabet, I thought uh, Beth's remarks particularly prompted from me, Juliet, Foxtrot, uh, Charlie. It, it was a pretty dire picture that uh, you painted. But I want to take you to the title of the speech, which was Taiwan, firstly, both of you. Uh, what would uh, the United States expect from Australia in the uh, instance of either a blockade or a full-on invasion of that island? And on a second note, I'm hoping for some ideas from you directly from Washington on AUKUS and whether there's any sense that you're picking up of frustration at the US end with Australia's capability or potential to deliver on some pretty big tasks given the size of the Australian Defence Force, the fact that this country hasn't built submarines for over two decades and that there is a long history also of having defence projects delayed or go off, off track. That never happens in America. <laughs> so, you know. I, I, will, I will take this first one, um, maybe, and I don't know, Richard, if you want to talk about AUKUS or add to my thoughts on the first one, but, you know, one of the good things that is that we are in a position right now where there is not an imminent Chinese invasion of Taiwan. So I, I think that there is time and what we should be doing with this time is to actually have a conversation in our respective societies about what would we want to do. So I think it's less to me about what America would expect Australia to do because I'm, America hasn't decided what it would do. And I think Relatedly, Australians should begin to have a conversation about what is important, what matters, what is really a threat, and how to think about this. Um, the purpose of AUKUS is to deter China and China's aggression, not to prevent them from competing fairly or to be present in the region, but to set standards for behavior and to say, you know, no, we're all together here, the rest of us saying, we don't like that and you can't do that. And I think people need to start understanding that um, China poses a pretty big threat, not just to the United States, not just to Taiwan, but actually to the way that we all want to live and have our governments work and do business. Um, and, and we've seen China go after all of that. So these are conversations we need to have. No, I think that's exactly right. And the only thing I would add to that point is that there is and needs to be conversations between the United States and Australia and with all of uh, the allies out here about what they could do if there's a variety of different contingencies. I mean, we talk about the China-Taiwan contingency, but there are other contingencies that we would talk about. I mean, Beth talked about North Korea and other things like that. At sort of the tactical and operational level, the intelligence sharing level, things like what capabilities are, you know, where things are and things like that. That is a wholly separate conversation from the decision to actually engage in military activity 
um, which would only be made by sovereign governments, including Australia, if and when we ever got to that point, and by the United States. There's no guarantee that the United States would. Um, and so I, th I think that's important to think about. There's a lot that can be done sort of tactically, operationally, but that big strategic question is one for Australia ultimately to decide completely on its own and for the United States and for Japan and for anyone else. And hopefully we'll never actually reach that question because this is about trying to deter war in the first place. On AUKUS, I haven't um, seen in, in Washington any, um, you know, uh, rolling of the eyes at, uh, at Australia. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's, this is a big project. It's extraordinarily ambitious. It's costly. Uh, and, you know, if it comes to fruition, it's going to be quite meaningful in terms of capabilities. Uh, we're still toward the very front end of this. Um, but, I mean, if you look at the signs of enthusiasm I mean, in Congress, there literally is an AUKUS caucus. I mean, this is, <laughs> and, and, you know, in, in the past year, two pieces of, two provisions in legislation have been passed by the Congress in order to make AUKUS more effective at sub-transfer legislation and, le and legislation on ITAR, these export control stuff. You know how hard it is to get Congress to do anything? I mean, you know, it's almost impossible, yeah. but, you know, they did he it for AUKUS. in history, and one of them was on AUKUS. Yeah, it, so, mm. so that's you know, kind of amazing. I mean, if you're looking for signs there, that, those, that's one. A, a follow-up, if I may, does Australia's geography ultimately become the most important factor in any cooperation between the United States and this country? Well, it's certainly important. Um, I mean, if you look at the military alliance perspective, it was the case that at one point, for example, the U.S. bases in Japan were outside the range of what China could reasonably hold at risk. That's no longer the case. And so this perimeter around which the, there's sort of a permissive level of activity um, includes places where the United States previously and continues to be active, but, you know, Australia is a safer place, just like in World War II that was the case. And so um, there are a lot of things that uh, Australia brings to the table other than geography, but certainly geography is one of them. Yeah, and I, I guess um, this gets to the whole idea of, I mean, it said geography is destiny, right? But it has been very similar in protecting the United States and Australia over the years. But what we need to grasp is that threats no longer are, are bounded by geography, right? When you have the number of cyber attacks on Australia that we're seeing, um, if you have some governments, the A-team, trying to recruit members of parliament, if you have threats to our GPS system, which means that you're your taxi driver and your Uber driver and your bank G ATM won't work. Um, if you have China and Russia going after your critical infrastructure via cyber, and they are, then this is why AUKUS matters. This is why Pillar 2 matters, is because this is actually about developing capabilities, shared capabilities, and taking the best of our countries technology and brain power and applying it to protect the way that people live every day. And so I, I'm really excited about AUKUS and I think it's very hard to understand why quantum computing is important. Um, needless to say though, Australia is one of the world leaders in quantum. We want to be a part of that in the United States. So I think that this, these are things that are hard to explain, and that's why I think having a conversation about these things is very important. Our next question comes from Tess Economou. Uh, thank you both very much for your time today. Beth, I note before that you said that an invasion of Taiwan wasn't imminent. I'm just wondering though, both of you, are either of you concerned that as the US is managing conflicts in Europe and the Middle East, um, and they're kind of drawn away from the Indo-Pacific, that a state might view that as an opportunity to act unilaterally in the region? Well, when the United States or any global power has uh, a military that is configured to fight one big war in one place rather than which was once the case, two big war, or two medium-sized wars or two regional wars, um, you always have the possibility of opportunistic aggression. So something's happening in some other part of the world and somebody says, oh, well, they're distracted, uh, now's the time. I doubt that that would be the catalyst for 
Xi Jinping deciding to make a move on Taiwan. I think there are other drivers if the Chinese decide at some point to blockade the island or to invade the island. I think there are political uh, considerations. There's yeah. military readiness considerations yeah. and capability considerations. And then there's sort of the personal timeline of the leadership. Um, and I think that those would be much bigger drivers than saying, oh, the, you know, the Americans look like they're doing a lot in Europe and oh, in the Middle East, so let's go now. I, I think that's, you can't exclude it completely, but I think it's very unlikely. So I'm super sad that you did not pick up what I was putting down oh. on my speech. Not you. No, I know, but the audience. I'm just sad that you the whole point, <laughs> I know. The whole point was that there are other things, these crocodiles closer to the boat, and one of them is China's aggression against uh, the Philippines. We have seen this intensify, right? They are pushing harder. They are not deterred. How far they'll go, I don't know. But, you know, two weeks ago, we have this water cannon injuring Philippine officers. Um, and now we're doubling down. Uh, on Sunday, we did a quadrilateral exercise with the Philippines, Japan, Australia, U.S. We're there. We're pushing back. So there's a lot of things going on right now, and I agree with you completely. I'm sorry to be mean. Um, but I, I think that this, this idea that people take advantage, absolutely true, but maybe not in the way that we have been thinking. Right? So we have to think a little bit more, I think, broadly, openly, and, and look at what's going around. Intelligence officers are trained. Whenever something is happening, the rest of the teams working on other things are like, OK, what's going on in our area? Is somebody going to take advantage of it? This happens around elections, happens on 9-11. You know, we really pay attention to how adversaries can take advantage. And one of the things that people don't talk about is the likelihood of a two-front war if there was a Taiwan scenario that Kim wouldn't sit there and just do nothing, and vice versa. So I think you have something there, but let's not only think about Taiwan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to all our working press for being here today. Our next question is from Colin Clark. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Uh, Beth, the first one is for you uh, because of your intelligence background. The it's one I'm country. Smart. Well, because intelligence yeah. I'll, I'll background. Give it to you. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> if the one country we haven't mentioned that's a major Pacific power is Russia. And oh, I'm glad that you raised that. Russia and North Korea are once again best buddies, and the Chinese are also. Uh, working very closely with the Russians, joint exercises, mm -hmm. all the rest. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting in North Korea, do you read this as a major increase in your military credibility and your freedom to act? Yes. And you look at the US shipbuilding plan, which is basically flat for a long time. Do you see this as a possible opening? Right, so this is one of the reasons I was talking about Kim's growing confidence. So one of the things I've been really interested in, and I don't know, Richard, if you experienced this, but at home I find that this conversation about how the theaters, the threat vector in the, in the world, they're all linked, right? This is something that Americans don't, some Americans don't want to get. Some people want to say like, oh, well, we just have to fight this war in you know, Ukraine, and. And that's the main thing. And other people say, like, forget about Ukraine. Let other people fight Ukraine. We just need to deal with the Pacific theater. And they're forgetting why Prime Minister Kishida at the White House, is at the White House right now mm -hmm. and why he's having um, this great relationship with the South Koreans. It's because the Russians and the Chinese literally are doing, you know, bomber runs around the Japanese island. And Prime Minister Kishida understands that all of these things are linked. That's why he's one of the main proponents of supporting Ukraine, because they're connected. So I do think that um, Kim has growing confidence, but I am also very, very interested in this, why is the number three in Pyongyang today? 
I would love to be a fly on that wall because this thing I was talking about at the UN where Russia vetoed the extension of UN sanctions monitors against North Korea, China abstained. In the past year or two, basically 18 months, China and Russia have been vetoing any sanctions monitor, any sanctions penalties for North Korea together. This is the first one where they're separated. And I think that the closeness of Russia and North Korea, you know, this bro fest going on between Kim and Putin, probably makes President Xi pretty unhappy. And I think the reason they're there is to say, uh, don't forget where your bread is buttered here, folks. Um, Kim, you need to pay attention to us too because we could cut you off. So I, th there, I think it, it definitely is giving Kim more confidence, but I also think that we have to pay attention to where their friction points and those need to be exploited as much as possible. We might just... If, if I may? Very briefly, yes. It's hard when I'm not brief. <laughs> Richard, <laughs> uh, as, as you, you look uh, more closely at the uh, actual vector between money and strategy, which is what really matters, um, are, is the United States actually demonstrating it is serious about its military in the Pacific through the budget? To uh, some degree. <laughs> Um, I mean, to, to answer that question more broadly, um, there's some obvious anomalies, right? So, for example, when the president had the ASEAN leaders to the White House, so they had this summit in Washington for the first time ever, and was kind of great fanfare, the United States announced $150 million uh, in commitments to Southeast Asia. Well, the Chinese, a few months before, had announced $1.5 billion, so that's 10 times as much. Who knows what that will come through, but it's a big number. And that same week, the Congress prepared a $40 billion package for Ukraine, right? Now, there's some obvious reasons for that, right? Ukraine is fighting for its life, and it uh, is dependent on aid from the West. Um, but whether you're looking at you know, those kinds of aid numbers or in the, um, in the allocation of resources within the defense budget, I think you're starting to see the kind of aircraft carrier shift in the direction, um, but you know, it's we're still coming out of um, you know two plus decades of war in the Greater Middle East with the legacy uh, systems and the personnel costs that are associated with that. Um, you've got constraints on the shipbuilding side, on the subbuilding side, and things like that. But I mean, if you look at the supplemental that God willing will pass the. Congress here soon, uh, you know, there's money for the Indo-Pacific in there for shipbuilding in a way that there wasn't mm -hmm. before. So those are good signs. The magnitudes are, are way less than Israel and Ukraine for obvious reasons. But I guess that's a long uh, way of saying I think you're seeing it move, start to move in that direction, but it's, I mean, it's certainly not there yet. Thank you. You know, um, can I just add that Australia passes its budget on time every time as part of your system. That's outrageous. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> you guys really need to appreciate what you have and protect it. <laughs> because we don't pass our budget now consistently since 2014. I think the average delay has been six months to pass our budget. We have the 2025 budget has just been submitted to Congress, but they only just passed the 2024 one six months late. That means that the money that goes into our defense industrial base can't be, can't be doled out in a reasonable amount of time. And so the biggest risk, I think, isn't so much that we're not paying attention because the budgets have things in there that are important. The biggest risk is that we're not, we're not doing our business our government business correctly because our Congress isn't passing our budgets on time and it's messing stuff up. Mm. So I'm just taking a shot at America right now, even though I love my country more than still, anything. Still a lot of compromise happens to get that through and some measures that are contentious don't make it through here either. Uh, Julie Hare. Julie Hare from the AFR, thank you very much. Um, Beth, you spoke about a bro fest between Kim and Putin. Um, that could be a three-way bro fest by the end of the year. 
um, based on recent history. Uh, given Trump's uh, history of holding some counterintuitive positions on various things, um, how do you see the um, US's relationship with the Indo-Pacific playing out? Should he become the next president? And how should his allies um, deal with him? Oh, that's an easy question. <laughs> you want to take that, Richard? I think they said Beth, comma, and then. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll back clean up. Back okay. clean up means. Yeah, uh, yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a really complicated question. I do think that, um, just for everybody to be clear, I'm a nonpartisan civil servant who happened to be a briefer for President Trump, so, um, but not part of the Trump administration. And so, um, I think that, you know, I'm never, I, I don't really publicly say things about President Trump because too much about policies, um, but because that relationship between a briefer, an intelligence briefer and a president is really important and it's kind of sacred. And I, I want that to continue no matter who becomes president, that they don't think that their briefer is going to come out and just blab about them. and. Um, good or bad, and, and you know, and that um, kind of plays it straight. So I'm always a little cautious about talking about this, and and um, you know, so, but I, I think that um, the the United States has a lot going in terms of Australia, and vice versa. We have interests, we have institutions, and we have mutual investment in each other. And I, I think that um, President Trump will understand and does understand those things and can understand those things. Um, bilateral relations go pretty well. Um, it did in the last administration uh, when pr Trump was president. And so, you know, there are going to be um, moments as with any president. But I think that people should just uh, be clear about what the shared interests are and go from there. I do think it's very interesting about North Korea and whether we could have a wild card there. Mm. Um, you know, some of the press, it could be wrong, it could be right. I have no idea about thinking about North Korea differently. Um, I wasn't against uh, President Trump going to and trying to negotiate with Kim. In the end, it didn't work out and he walked away and that was the right thing to do. Um, so I think that, you know, having new ideas and trying them out as long as they are thoughtful um, and, and people talk with allies about them, and you know, that's not a bad thing. So we'll have to see. But there's one thing we can say clearly. No administration, Republican or Democratic, has solved the North Korea question. Mm -hmm. Our policy is broken. We have not deterred them. We have not fixed the problem. So we're in a bad shape. We're in a bad position. So we do have to think about doing something. Otherwise, we're going to be in a, an even worse place where North Korea can literally coerce us off and out of, of South Korea and, and uh, North Asia. Um, being less encumbered. Uh, <laughs> Please. Uh, I, no, I would say for the big components of the U.S.-Australia relationship, I think they're likely to obtain whether Joe Biden or, Do or Donald Trump is elected. So. Um, you know, the alliance itself, I think AUKUS keeps on going if you have a Trump presidency or a Biden presidency. Um, you know, obviously the intelligence relationship, uh, you know, all these kinds of things. I think there's probably two areas, neither of which are specific to Australia, that you would see differences. One is in trade. Now, um, I mean, the Biden administration kept all of the trade protectionism measures, including all the tariffs and things in place that Trump uh, went on and added a couple more here and there. Um, the United States has a trade surplus with uh, Australia, and so that has, you know, probably kept Australia out of any crosshairs of, you know, a Trump administration. But, you know, there's some talk about there, and who knows whether this would happen about, you know, a uh, new Trump administration putting a 10% tariff on everything imported in the United States, right? Well, that would, that would affect uh, Australia, or, you know, an even tougher line at the WTO or something like that. Again, not specific to Australia, but, but the ripple effect could, you know, lap up on the shore. The other is probably not what people think about uh, either, but it's on the transatlantic side, actually. I mean, if, if President Trump came in and actually did cut off aid to Ukraine on the first day and decide that he was going to try to negotiate an end to the war in, uh, in Ukraine that gave Russia some, you know, semblance of, of significant victory there, that's, that would affect Australia. Not directly, 
but you know if the lesson to a would-be aggressor is you can uh, pay a pretty high price for a territorial conquest, but if you wait out the West, it takes two years, maybe three years, and you get to keep what you got. That's not a good lesson for anybody to have, including in this part of the world. Um, and that's, you know, I don't know whether that will happen, uh, but, you know, that's a possibility. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate the candor. <laughs> David Crow. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you both for your remarks. David Crow from the City Morning Herald and the Age of Melbourne. Uh, I want to pick up on something that Richard said, you said a moment ago, uh, and then get you both to talk about AUKUS. Um, because I think in one of your answers, Richard, you said, if it comes to fruition, and I thought that's an interesting phrasing, if AUKUS comes to fruition, because I think there, there is a group in Australia that would say, look, it's moving slowly. We just heard this news from the United States about the capacity to build the, the next Virginia-class submarines. It's slower than we thought. When will Australia be able to get them? will we be able to make the new submarines with the UK in the way that's being promised? So there's a cynicism about whether it can be delivered, and I'm interested in views from both of you on that high-level question. Can act, given what's happening at the moment, given what's happened over the last year or so, do you believe AUKUS can be delivered? And would it be delivered, and you answered this in part, would it be delivered under a Trump administration? Yeah, I wouldn't read too much into my selection of the word if as opposed to yeah, I don't when or eventually or things. I wasn't trying to convey any sort of secret uh, cynicism. I mean, I, I, you know, I, not being a shipbuilding expert myself, all I can really do is appeal to those who have been working on it on the U.S. side, and I know these folks quite well, and they are optimistic and believe that the so-called optimal pathway is and can be successful. I don't know, as I said, will be successful. I don't know, <laughs> now I'm starting to, uh, but, but uh, yes, I think overall there is significant optimism. I think people appreciate the scale of the endeavor, but I mean, there's no, I haven't heard anybody, certainly on the American side, that's a defeatist about the whole thing. Um, and then, yeah, I just repeat my answer on Trump. I think if Trump is elected, it's, it's seen as a win-win for all kinds of reasons, the investment in the, I mean, first of all, you have the investment and the capability, and so from a strategic point of view and a deterrence point of view, it's valuable, and then you have sort of the spin-off economic benefits of the boost to the uh, U.S. Uh, submarine industrial base because of the Australian investment there and you know, other things like that. So it's really hard to see what the downside that might be grounds for objection would be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the first, um, in the first administration for, for Trump, um, he cared deeply about U.S. shipbuilding, about being competitive, uh, about the U.S. Navy being competitive. Um, and so I think that that makes a lot of sense that he would care about this. Um, I, you know, I read a lot um, and talk to a lot of people about military issues. I care about it. Um, I'm not an expert, obviously, but, you know, these, these systems do take a long time to deliver. I think that they will be delivered ultimately because when you look at, you know, how the U.S. success rate, it, sometimes it doesn't, it's not smooth, but on something like, you know, we know how to make a Virginia-class submarine. It's not like we don't know how to do it. Um, we're going to do it. Um, and, and I think that Australia will benefit from that um, in terms of way before that sub arrives. Having the repair facilities, for example, um, having the technology and the de depth of that technology, I think that there are all sorts of things that really strengthen the deterrence purpose of this well before the sub is actually delivered. And I get back to Pillar 2 again because it's confusing, it's hard to explain, but there are things that are happening now on this that are very important and are real and will benefit everybody um, much more immediately. And I, something Richard said, what did you say? I just lost my train of thought here about um, how that, how AUKUS will turn out here. What was it? Oh, I've lost my train of thought. Maybe I'll think of it in a minute. A little jet lag, sorry. That's we'll come right. back to it. We'll come back to it. Thank Jeez. you. Uh, Melissa Code. Hi, both Melissa Code from the Mandarin. No affiliation with the PRC. <laughs> um, the Foreign Minister on Wednesday 
spoke about how American leadership remains indispensable. It is the great builder of alliances and networks, essential for balancing a multipolar region. In the recent few months, Australia has hosted the Prime Minister of Samoa and Fiji, and they, in their own way, have talked about being um, subject to geopolitics and foreign policy rather than actual actors in that endeavour. And so just picking up on some of the wonderful themes that the NSC conference have looked at in addition to defence and uh, military threat, peace, resilience, mutual trust, how can sovereign nations in the region, Indo-Pacific, Southeast Asia, be confident that the superpower America won't just, this isn't just part of an ongoing latter-day pivot, as you put it, but but something serious for the, the long haul. All right. Well, if I were president. Go for it. No, I, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the great things about Americans is that even though we mess up sometimes, we actually care. I mean, we're naively um, like other countries, other cultures. We want the world to be better. We want to contribute. And sometimes we don't actually do the right thing, but we, we're trying to, um, even in those moments. And I, and I think that um, it's incumbent for allies like Australia, like New Zealand, like our Pacific Island partners, Indonesia, you name it, um, just to help Americans understand what those other perspectives are. You know, we're a big country and we're kind of used to rattling around the world and doing our thing, and yet I think that we want to hear, we want to hear. And so um, I think that ha Australia plays a very, very big role in helping, uh, helping the United States do the right thing by um, helping the region represent itself and its needs um, rather than being pawns. When Secretary Blinken you know, says that we don't want to force, the United States doesn't want to force countries to choose, he really believes that and means that. It's just that um, you know, sometimes our big bureaucracy and our actions um, it doesn't always feel that way. We might just with time pressing on, thank you so much, Melissa, uh, just come straight to our cameo appearance. Yeah, thank you for the Roy cameo. Metcalf, <laughs> the uh, head of the National Security College. I did begin College. my career as a journalist, so it's, it's great to be here. Uh, so Rory Medcalf, head of the National Security College and host of our fantastic visitors. Uh, firstly, a thank you for being so uh, forthright and illuminating. One of the themes of the conference we've had this week is the need for plainer speaking about national security, and we've certainly been hearing that from you, so thank you. Um, question, which is really about some, some of the rest of us, uh, not the United States, not China, uh, not Russia either for that matter, but looking at middle powers, or more than middle powers, uh, the, the middle power and big democracies around the world uh, that are not the United States. Uh, you know, I know you're not here to preach or give us advice, but uh, some thoughts on, if you like, the, uh, the strengths and the challenges of middle powers banding together to try to really set the context for, uh, I guess, the US behaviour that we want to see in the Indo-Pacific uh, and the world. And I guess as a little adjunct to that, to what extent is this really about middle powers geographically here, Australia, Japan, uh, and some of our other friends in the Indo-Pacific, and to what extent is this about the need for global coalitions for uh, the rules-based order that we want. Thank you. On this idea of middle powers, I think actually Australia is a very good example. Um, and it seems maybe more obvious to some of us in Washington than it sometimes feels like it is in Australia that they're, they're often, as particularly during US presidential election years, the question is, who's going to win and what are they going to expect from Australia or what are they going to ask of Australia? And the idea is that there's sort of, you know, there's this list and we hand to the Australians. <laughs> they say, all right, we'll do one, three, four, and, you know, and it doesn't ever actually work out that way, but it, but it's more dramatically different still, because if you look at, um, these worries about sovereignty or being caught or having uh, decision making being constrained by the United States or maybe by China. Look at the leadership that Australia has shown over the past few years. So who was the first country to come out and say Huawei 
should not build out 5G networks because of their security risk. It was not the United States, it was Australia. And then they came to Washington to make their case and then it was a little lonely for them because we didn't sort of <laughs> immediately get on the bus. But we did eventually and that was an Australian kind of led thing. Um, you know, the interference in Australian domestic politics at the hands of China, the domestic legislation that was passed here, I mean that was, that was uh, seen as kind of a canary in the, in the coal mine. There was not a playbook to be done by that, but Australia was a, a leader in this. AUKUS, I, I've heard since I've been here a lot of this, well, you know, AUKUS is really designed to get, you know, Australia to be constrained by the United States. Australia asked the United States and the UK for AUKUS, not the other way around. This was not foisted. They were the leader in saying that this is a new capability that we believe we need to have for the defense of our country and deterrence of war in this region. Um, you know, standing up to uh, the Chinese at the hands of the economic coercion after mm. having the temerity to call for an independent investigation into coronavirus's origins um, was a playbook for how uh, middle size and frankly even bigger capitalist democracies that nevertheless are, have a dependency, an economic dependency on China can, can preserve their, their political preferences, their, their democracy, their freedom of speech, their, their um, their sovereignty. And so um, I think that is true broadly of middle powers and is likely to be even more true as, you know, this grand competition between the United States and China, which is really increasingly between the United States on one hand and all of its friends and allies and China and Russia and Iran and North Korea working together in different ways. Middle powers are going to be critical uh, in determining in what direction other countries respond and the freedom of action they believe they have. And I think here Australia has been a leader, not only could be. And we're going to squeeze in one last question, if we can. Uh, Jennifer Jacket, the Sir Ronald Wilson Scholar at the ANU National Security College. Thank you so much. Thanks, Richard and Beth. Beth, I wanted to pick up on something you mentioned around AUKUS and some of those benefits actually being potentially nearer term, even though the submarines and some of those asymmetric capabilities through Pillar 2 may still be years away. While that's happening, we're seeing a build-up of military capability in China, um, fueled by rapid um, technological advancement. So what I'm interested in is with the capabilities the US and its allies have today, how can we strengthen and restore deterrence in some of those flashpoints that you talked about, whether that's North Korea or the Philippines, with the capability we have now? That's really mean, Jennifer. It's <laughs> like the hardest question ever. And actually, um, everybody should follow Jennifer because she's doing fantastic work and thinking about technology and knows much more about this than I do. Um, but I do think that this is, the idea is that um, our toolkit needs to be bigger than just military. We can't just do, go from sanctions to like military attacks. We've got to figure out something in between. And, you know, this is all about asymmetric capabilities. It's about gray zone. And again, there needs to be more of a conversation about these things because we have to figure out about how do we deter in this space by also, but also stay true to our democratic values. You know, we're not going to go and do the kinds of things in China or Russia that they do to us um, in the same way. But but we have to, as democratic societies, not just sit back and think like, oh, well, you guys can do whatever you want and get in our critical infrastructure and, you know, what are we going to do? Um, and so technology um, and deterrence really are increasingly going to go hand in hand. And that can be deterrence by denial in terms of creating resilience, really protecting ourselves. But at some point, we do have to think about, hmm, I wonder if there's something else that we should be doing there in terms of, if you do this, we're going to raise the cost so high on you um, in the way that we would respond to that, that you should not do that. Uh, and again, um, there's a wide latitude of things in our toolkit that we can do from um, things that are, that are quite benign to things that are quite serious. And we need to develop that toolkit. August is a huge part of that. Um, AUKUS Pillar 2 in terms of the technology and then Pillar 1 in terms of the deterrence. Well, thank you both so much. We could keep on talking about this for many more hours, I feel, but we'll have to leave it there for today. Thanks everyone for joining us. Please thank Beth Sanna and Richard Fontaine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.